went to Japan beginning of 1989. Japanese had animal spirits, bullish on equities. Japan was supposed to overtake the United States in size of the economy. Wild, wild market it was. That's why I want you here. I want to talk to somebody who's been on the ground through the Japan late 80s bubble and burst. I've been watching, listening to you since before I was even at Real Vision. The one other thing that I heard you get bullish on is currently Japan. And so that really perked up my ears. There is a really good bullish long-term case here for me to be an owner of Japan Inc. again. The Bank of Japan raised rates on New Year's Eve 1989 and the market reacted to that and went down. And it just kind of kept going down you know, for years and years and years. I want to see if there are parallels to that. The bullish outlook currently is happening, with, especially with the foreign community on Japan equities. Simultaneously, near unanimous consensus agreement of Japan is going to be normalizing policy and exiting this radical easing. How do you reconcile those two? Anyone that watches Japan and follows it understands the importance of the words they choose. So let's talk about what normalization means in Japan moving from negative to positive 10 basis points. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but the message it sends is incredibly powerful. Interest rates in Japan don't need to get too high before an awful lot of capital will start coming home to the bond market and to the equity market. There's a lot more value to be had in rotating out of the US and into Japan. I'd like to welcome as our very first guest of the Across the Spread podcast, Mr. Grant Williams. Grandson, thank you for joining us. Oh, hell, because I'm us. I am, I am good. <laughs> I'm going to call you Grandson. Um, I'm going to call you Grantson because I know that I've heard you on a podcast before. I forgot who it was, and they were saying how, uh, you know, Americans like myself, we call you Grant, and it's really Grant. Grant. But if. But if, yeah, but if I say Grant, then I sound like kind of like a, an, an arrogant, but if I say it kind of as a Grant son, that's kind of how the Japanese would say it, you know, kind of, you it kind of mixes in, William, blends in. William's son, that's what you used oh. to call me in the, in, the, in the office, but don't, don't do that. Just call whatever you want. William's son, there's a ton that I want to get through with you today and most certainly will not be able to get through all of it that I have planned, but let's see what we can do. But the main purpose to get you on here today, first of all, I know that you started your career off in finance, in institutional finance, in Tokyo, Japan, of all places. Mm -hmm. And you did so during a particularly interesting time in global macro, not just Japan markets. I believe the year was 1988, 89 was when you started? Uh, yeah, I started my career in 85 in the city, uh, but I went to Japan beginning of 1989, yeah. And you were trading warrants. Yes, I was trading Japanese equity warrants. And, and I'm smiling as I say that <clears throat> because uh, anyone that was around during those days will will know uh, what a wild, wild market it was. Uh, and that's why I want you here because I want to know, um, I want to talk to somebody who's been on the ground and who has lived through the Japan late 80s bubble and burst. I want to know... Look, there's a myth. It's it's a myth in my head because if it's not it's not something I saw, it's not fact. So therefore, there's a, a myth that apparently J Japanese had animal spirits at one point. Apparently, there was a wild, there was like there, there were bullish on equities and they were like there was like a, you know a massive growth and all that and just Japan was supposed to overtake the United States in terms of you know the size of the economy and all that. What happened? So we'll get yeah. to that what uh, happened look, part two. Um, no, no, you, you're right, and and it's funny because um, because it, it is. It's almost impossible if you weren't there to conceive of such a thing as you, as you say. I mean, I, I know your, your tongue's firmly in your cheek, but it's so true because uh, people have spent their entire career and retired during a time when Japan has been inconsequential on the global um, landscape, apart from obviously people looking at the yen carry trade and what the Bank of Japan have been doing. Japanese right. equity market has been completely forgotten. And Japan is really only important to most people thanks to central bank policy actions and, and because of the currency. So it's really difficult to conceive of a time when Japan was, um, <clears throat> as you say, supposed to overtake the US as the most powerful economy on earth. Uh, the Japanese were buying every trophy asset you could think of in the world. You know, they, they famously bought Pebble Beach golf course at the top. They bought the Rockefeller Center. They bought all these hugely iconic properties um, in the US. And of course, that happened right before the bubble burst. But it, and, and again, just to talk on that at the end and we can jump back whichever way around you want to do it but um it's funny i i never think of it as a 
bursting of a bubble to me, um, simply because we didn't really get that. You know, we saw the Nasdaq fall 85% in a matter of months when the dot-com bubble burst. And we didn't really see that in Japan. There wasn't a, a day where there was this, oh my God moment. You know, the, the, the Bank of Japan raised rates on New Year's Eve 1989 and New Year's Day 1990, I forget which one it was. Mm -hmm. Top tick. And the market reacted to that and went down. And it just kind of kept going down you know, for years and years and years. And so I look back on the, uh, the 87 crash and I look back on the dot-com bubble and I look back on 2008 and there were catalytic moments that we all went through that were like, whoa. And it, and it may be that, you know, I was 22 when I went to Japan, so I was too young or too traumatized to remember, but I'd been through 87, so I don't think so. But I just don't, I just don't remember it that way as, a, as an event that then spiraled out of control. It just kind of stopped going up, started going down, and just kept going down. And, and that, I think, is why over the years so many people got sucked back into Japan because it, because it was just kind of going lower people would, it would reach a point they go, okay, now's the bounce, now's the bounce. And there, and there were so many kind of false dawns over the years that I think that's what led to a lot of the disillusionment. And people were like, oh, okay, I'm, I give up on Japan. Uh, and of course, they gave up on Japan right as um, right as they should probably be be paying attention to it again. Right. Well, that's also what I want to talk to you too about. This is not a history lesson. This is a how to maybe potentially apply it to today. Given that Japan equities are, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, for the second year now <laughs> outperforming major TM indices um, uh, and with purely foreign inflows at that and almost unanimous approvals. Of, you know, you don't really hear that other side except for from the Japan domestic community. So yeah. I want to see if there are parallels to that. And I want to talk to somebody who I've familiarized myself with over the years of uh Stock in your career, which I'll get into in a moment, but what I mean by that, and find out like kind of the nuances, the idiosyncrasies that you probably saw on the ground, um, and what the kind of the mood was, what the culture was like, what the kind of atmosphere is like in a Japan equity, you know, you want to call it a bubble or whatever it is. Right. Very interesting that how you call it a not burst, but you know, a kind of slow decline and all that kind of thing. So, if there are applicable things, because I'm kind of drawing a lot of parallels, but then again, maybe I'm forcing them. And I think that there's a ton of invaluable insight that this is not stuff that you could read out of some uh, article of the New York Times business section from 1989, um, which I've done plenty of, <laughs> of that right. stuff. And I want the foreign review. I want the foreign review. Sure. Yeah. So, I know that how you kind of, you know, in a very respectable way, kind of snuck your way into. By that, I mean you really earned your way into that uh, front office no, no, you're role. Right. Snuck's a better word. Yeah, I, I kind of did the same thing. I, I moved here um, after Abenomics was launched. I, I have a you know horrendous academic record. I'm not supposed to be in finance. And then I got onto the Goldman trading desk because I moved here with like nothing. I had no like credentials to work here. I had no, I had no place to live, no ability to speak the language, contacts, nothing like that. And I just kind of kicked down the doors of all the financial institutions. Goldman like saw me as a kind of an insane but interesting potential person to interview. 20 something interviews later, I'm trading futures and options at the Goldman trading desk. So we both kind of did not go through the traditional routes into finance. The reason, by the way, that I say that kind of stalking your career is because I know that you were at Jeffrey's Asia. I was also at Jeffrey's in Japan. And then subsequent to that, obviously, Real Vision, you were there. We did not overlap, but I was at Real Vision as, as well. Right. So I was going to ask you at the end of this, what's next for my career, Grant? <laughs> well, hey, to tell you, sadly, it's starting to get downhill from here, my friend. <laughs> but is it? Okay. I, that's, that's very um, inspiring. Um, but t tell me what it's like in a, I mean, I guess we call it like a, a mania in terms of relative Japan terms, but like... Uh, equity markets will only go up sort of environment. And I'm not saying that that's what the current environment is in Japan, but in that environment at that time, what did Japan animal spirits look like? Um, yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think, you know, again, it's difficult to, to conceive of that kind of Japan where there was so much money flowing into Japan and everybody wanted to own all these, these stocks in Japan um, because it's been such a long time, but it really was, there was a wave of money from overseas investors pouring into Japan. Um, but the difference was it was competing alongside a wall of domestic money. And that, you know, that domestic component has been the missing ingredient in the last um, period. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was working for a, a bank called Robert Fleming, which has long since been swallowed up by JP Morgan. And, you know, this was a time when 
banks like Fleming's and Bearings, remember them before Nick Leeson uh, yep. uh, put them over the brink. Nick um, Trading. Yeah, these were small. Yeah, these are small UK investment banks who who were gigantic parts of that market. You know, punching far far above their weight. A lot of the American banks didn't really, have, including Goldman, didn't really have a meaningful presence in Japan at all back then. Um, and in fact, interestingly, the 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 peak of the bubble kind of came. You know, about a year or so, maybe a little bit more, a couple of years, maybe, yeah, maybe a year or so after Goldman really kind of came to Japan and said, this is a market that we want to. And they, and they brought incredible discipline to that market and, in, and, a, and a much more rigorous framework than existed in the, in the warrant market at the time. It was really wild, wild west market. It was crazy. Um, and so you, you would have entire months plural, where you didn't have a losing day on the trading desk because the market just kept going up and up and up and up. And you'd go, you know, you'd, you'd go a year without having a losing month quite often. Do you mean and market making or prop trading? Uh, both, both. Okay. Um, and the two, the two were much more closely conjoined than they are today, where there's this separation between the two, the, the market makes and the traders were the same. I mean, literally the same, there was no wall between them. You know, I was, I was, a market maker, but the, the the book that I was making the markets off was my prop trading book. Mm. Um, and so you, you just had this incredible hunger to be, to have a piece of Japan, just the way there was everyone would have a piece of China a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and it really was animal spirits. And, and that those animal spirits, to me, felt much more driven by the foreigners. It never felt to me like the Japanese uh, were going crazy. There was a lot more. I don't know how to put it, but it, I'm sure there's a there's a beautifully uh, colourful Japanese word that describes in intricate detail a, a very special kind of emotion. I, I love all those those words in Japan. But um, it felt to me like certainly the business we were doing, there was an awful lot of um, foreign fund managers just looking to get a foothold in Japan. And so uh, as as that bubble inflated and burst, it sucked in capital but i don't remember it being uh and this was in the pre-24 hour news age obviously so we didn't have cnbc blaring in the background so it didn't feel the same and everywhere you would go you when you were bombarded by stories about how the stock market was on fire and, and and people weren't being enticed into the markets it was a lot more you know you had the, the nikkei you had the asai shimbun and then you had the japan times you know the um, tagline yesterday's news tomorrow so that was that was not much help to everybody um, so it uh, that's really was... interesting that you say that, though, like as somebody on the ground, I get to understand a f like the foreign international community not being bombarded, but you're it wasn't you weren't being bombarded here. Like, well, again, it was it was hard to get a sense of that. Right. Mm. Because um, the only the only foreign TV network, this was 1980s, the 80s, right? it was a long time ago. The only foreign network we had to watch TV on was CNN, CNN International, not even CNN. So um, it was kind of a CNN light, if you like. And they had, you know, however long they had to do the news, so they didn't really focus on the Japanese stock market. So foreigners, apart from your Reuters terminal, as it was then, um, and a few people had Bloomberg's, I didn't back then, um, you really were, uh, you were really immersed in Japan, but in the markets, and we get, we get perspectives on how Japan is being viewed overseas from our clients saying, look, you know, we need to do this. And we've read this story and that story and the news was breaking all over the place. But it never felt to me and other people may remember it differently, but it never felt to me as though there was this all consuming media driven uh, push to get everybody worked up about the stock market. So there wasn't something that would be the equivalent of your current today's Uber driver talking about xyz stock going buying tesla or something like that you know like that kind of was there no like you know you go to some bar somewhere the and there's boy. yeah yeah or the, the mrs watanabe's to be um or whatever they you know I, look, I guarantee there was because like i said you know joe kennedy had the shoeshine boy back in the 1920s so of course that person's out there but again i think being a foreigner in japan and being at the time a very young foreigner i was 22 mm. years old um so you know i, I didn't it was, it was the first time I've been abroad. And so as much as I love Japan and the culture and all that stuff, I, I've, I was very isolated within the kind of expat community. Um, right. You know, I had friends that I worked with who were locals and we'd go out with them and stuff, but I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time purely in a, a group of locals and, and I couldn't speak the language. Obviously I, I got there 
when I got there. Um, so I, but it was just a set. I never felt that sense of it being, you know, you'd walk through Shibuya and, uh, you know, the Shibuya Kosaten, that big crossing that everyone's seen videos of where thousands of people cross the road. You know, they still had the big video screens up. And I don't ever remember seeing anything about the market on there. Mm. I didn't, you know, it wasn't like you go to Times Square and you'll see headlines Strong going across the, 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 you just, just didn't see that. At least I didn't. So I, and I say my memory of it may be very, very different to other people's. Um, but that's just how I, how I remember it. The, the, the foreign hunger mm. to be involved in Japan, um, was palpable to me. Um, the domestic hunger, I saw it through the orders we get from the life insurers and, you know, they put some big orders in to, to buy stuff. Mostly very rarely did they sell. Um, but I never felt like when I was in New York in the late nineties, I was in New York when the, when the dot com bubble peaked. I would be in line at the cafeteria and all anyone was talking about was Cisco and Lucent and all these crazy stocks. That was all people were talking about. And I just never got that sense in Japan that that was what was happening. Interesting. Interesting. Because the, like, um, I mean, currently it's, pre it's presence is everywhere. It's, there's advertisings everywhere. I mean, this is kind of funny. It's like, it's almost an indicator of, you know, I live by close to like the Roppongi area, Roppongi crossing. There's a gigantic, um, kind of advertisement billboard for Bitcoin, a Bitcoin trading platform. And then once Bitcoin uh, fell out of bed, that actually is currently an, an FX trading platform. <laughs> uh, got replaced by that. <laughs> um, and now retail FX has hit record uh, trading volumes in 2022. Um, and so, but it's very, very prevalent um, here. So um, I was seeing if there's any parallels. So I guess now, I guess that would be different. My, my only kind of wonder, uh, thinking out loud, is that maybe because you entered finance like that you didn't have a relative sort of you know framework to come from so maybe perhaps you thought maybe it was around you and you just thought that this is how things are it's quite possible yeah it's quite possible but one thing i would say about what you just said there um obviously uh the as you said you got this big thing in Rapongi, now that didn't used to be there with the bitcoin screens on it all that stuff wasn't there we had no social media uh, in Japan, we didn't have access to overseas. We didn't, never had CNBC. We didn't have any any of that access that, that where the froth in other countries and that FOMO, like, wow, this is all going on here. And also, after such a long bear market, um, it becomes much easier to 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 pump the Japanese market to the Japanese. It's like, finally, right? Finally, our market is starting to do something, and, and there is that FOMO. You all, you've all seen what the US has done. Well, Japan's down here. It's time to get involved in Japan. So it, I can I can absolutely see how it would be much much different this time because there are so many tools through which this information can spread and so many ways that you can engage and entice people let's call it what it is to to get into the markets no matter what um, and you know I think the Japanese are just as susceptible to that as the Americans are as the English are as the Aussies Canadians so it makes perfect sense to me that it would be much more intense this time around and that you know that gives me great hope for the future, along with some trepidation about how that could get out of hand. But I think it's, it's early in the piece that people are being sucked into the Japanese market. We've had a year and a half and you know, Nikkei is finally making the sort of headlines that we've been waiting for for 30 odd years about new highs. Um, so we'll see, you know, it feels a little overbought to me now. It feels like there's been a little bit of this kind of craziness. So it wouldn't surprise me to see a few setbacks now. Um, but I think I think as time goes on, I think there is there is a lot more value to be had in in rotating out of the U.S., for example, and into Japan. Sure, yeah, that's some, that's actually a theme that I had been discussing throughout all of um, 2023. The big, you know, one of the biggest sort of U.S. equity market themes was where's the breadth in the market? That's just it still is for that matter. Well, my thought was you have a ton of international allocation going into Japan of all places and then you also are sit for once you're getting paid to sit on the sidelines with you know yields uh, as, as high as they are and so you don't have to actually necessarily participate um, you could wait for your pullback if especially following a horrendous year in 2022 and so the active capital was in Japan so if you're wondering where the market breadth went it went to Japan like the breadth in the topics names are, I mean it's spread across it's not the Magnificent Seven the fact that Magnificent Seven even exists as a word is kind of because it sounds better than capital that went to Japan, seven, basically. But yeah, so 1989, Nikkei, 38,957. Top tick. PE was at 60. Uh, currently, PE is at 16x. 
Um, uh, 60 PE, were people validating that at the time? I mean, I kind of have a feeling that it came from the international community that first was probably a little bit like, all right, this is getting a little ridiculous, um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. But net net, there had to be people just validating like, yeah, no, there's, the Japan is different and the 60 PE is fine and you can't use those sort of metrics. Can you kind of walk through that, like kind of ignoring the signs of the this time is different, but it's not? Yeah, uh, look, I mean, of course, people are justifying it, right? That's how these bubbles work. Um, you know, they, they get to new normals and new paradigms and permanently higher plateaus. You know, they get to these places and, and, and there is always a justification for why this time is different. Um, and of course, it, ultimately, it never is. Um, otherwise, every market in the world would be trading above a 60 P. You know, 60 would be the new normal. And it just isn't <laughs> because there's a, there's a period when price matters. And there's a period when value matters and the switch between those two environments when it becomes less about price and more about values that's when you see these falls that's when you see these revaluations of markets and we have been make no mistake in a purely price driven environment in the us and in other um, developed markets but mostly the us we've been in a, a price intensive environment for a long time now the price has been what's mattered you know number go up and all that um, and while that's been happening in those Magnificent Seven, and, and not much further than that, if you look at the, the performance of the US market, the value has slowly been accruing to Japan because the market's been unloved. The companies have done a, a tremendous job, even though it's been forced on them into getting their house in order and getting their balance sheets much, much better shape. Um, and there's this lack of interest. And so that's, that's what you need to to allow the value to become more important because the price doesn't go anywhere. The companies get better, the results get better, the balance sheets get stronger, and then suddenly you realize that with the price not going anywhere and the underlying business getting better, the multiples compress, and you suddenly are looking at a, a, at a market that is still, I think, the third largest economy in the world, is a, is a deep liquid market. Um, yes, there are some issues with the Bank of Japan's ownership of ETFs, and yes, there are some issues with the Bank of Japan's ownership in the bond market, but, you know, if you're inclined to do the work, and this is a really important component of this, you don't just want to be lazy like we've all become used to and buy the ETF or you know buy a basket of stocks. If you want to do the work and be a stock picker and go to Japan and kick the tires of companies and try and understand a business, um, this is a great time to do that. And this mindset, um, I was with a group of people in Mexico talking about this last week, and, and uh, the last thing I left them with, I said, Try and switch your mindset from buying shares to taking apart ownership in a business. Because mm -hmm. they're two very different mindsets. If you're buying shares, there's, a, there's an implied outcome there that I'm going to sell my shares for a higher price. I'm going to make money on the shares. Not necessarily I want to own the business. And, and that, that idea of ownership, of wanting to, to own a part of a good, well-run, profitable business becomes important when it's not just number go up because when the number stops going up, you see the businesses that are not worth the price, they get re-rated very, very quickly. And what do people do with that money? They look, okay, I need some value here. And I think we're on the cusp of that switch. I think Japan has been leading the way, as it has in many areas, in terms of policy. But I think Japan has been leading that way in terms of the switch of money looking for value. And that's, that's what's driven Japan higher, has been an acknowledgement of value um, an, an accumulation of value, and that has naturally led to expanding multiples and higher prices. The opposite is happening in the US. The right. prices are going up, and the value is being further and further disengaged from the price. And there will be a reckoning with that. So I, I think it's important for people to to start getting into that mindset of, okay, I've been I've been chasing price, and I've done really, really well. I've done incredibly well if I've chased price. And not because the businesses are great, not because the economy is great, but because the price has been going up. And, and we understand that obviously uh, interest rate policy and stimulus has been a huge driver of that price appreciation. But there's been, in many cases, very little value appreciation. And that, I think, is the big change. And that's what I think has been one of the drivers of Japan. People who make that switch from price to value tend to do it early. And so you've, you've seen people recognizing this difference and looking for Japan and looking for value, finding it in Japan and rotating. And sooner or later, other people get dragged along and sucked into it. And I, and I think that's the, that's the part of the cycle we're in now. We haven't seen 
the collapse of price is the narrative in the US yet, um, as, as the first month of the year demonstrates. But I would say if you go back and look at the, the January of 87, of 2008, of 1929, three big market crashes, you will see, in one case, I think 1929, I think the Dow went up 38% in January. Um, so these are not these are not unprecedented things to happen at the at the peak of a bull market, uh, and I think people need to be aware of that. Yeah, I was listening to your. I think it was the last episode of the year of the things that make you go podcast that you did with the two mics, and you were talking about yeah, first you know, of this year, yeah. Or okay, first oh, first of this year, right? And you were talking about obviously Mike Green about passive flows and and all that and um which is something that i've certainly long subscribed to and you know it's very evident that that's happening um and uh, to your point yeah like if you look at softbank 998 for softbank which is a what i i used to call it a reverse if that's a tech stock it's an inverse 1x inverse like tech stock is what i call it but uh it's like what top three component of the nikkei 225 index and yet its share price has been flat in the year where the nikkei's blowing out to 30 some year highs yeah. and it's not just getting swept up with the index necessarily um so you know there yeah, because, is like because, a... but, but but why would it western if you think about it why would it it's yep. already run it's hugely overvalued there's so many question marks not just around softbank but massason and and the way he invested and the way he invested was great for that period of time when it was all about price <clears throat> and it got swept up along with the Mag Seven and all the big names—it became a name that people would chase the price. You go to Japan now. Why would you buy SoftBank when there are so many great companies? Yeah, no, I, I'm a—I'm not saying that it—it sh it should be higher. I'm saying that come more, more from a market mechanical perspective of if there was that same sort of mechanism and structural passive flows in which the top weightings get ever larger because they get ever larger and all that. That structure is—if you look at SoftBank—is kind of an example of that kind of corruption of price discovery and price action is not yet in Japan yet. Um, but uh, it's, it's not a, a passive and index flow driven market. You can do large cap stock picking in Japan currently at the moment if you do your homework. I've been watching, listening to you since I, I don't even know for how long. Um, before I was even at Real Vision, when I was just Real Vision sub subscriber, I've only ever heard you discuss gold in a bullish way. And it's not even in sort of an investment portfolio way. You're kind of talking about it as something that you're not even going to sell. You know, it's it's so I don't even like count it as a... And then the one other thing that I heard you get bullish on is currently Japan. And so that really perked up my ears. Like, I've never heard you outwardly make a case for a particular security, like a particular market or, or something like that. And so that makes me very interested and in a whole litany of reasons why people who are long Japan are long Japan. I believe yours primary, primarily is that there is a actual corporate governance shift that is underway that will indeed unlock value that has been long suppressed for the entirety of uh, the post bubble era. First of all, is it, do I have correct your overall primary bullish thesis that's, or reason? <clears throat> that's certainly one of the reasons. Uh, it's certainly one of the reasons. You know, I think there are a whole bunch of things coming together in Japan that, that, that make it attractive from a value perspective. It's interesting what you said because um, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, I, I have advocated for gold in a portfolio for 20 plus years. Bullish outlook currently, it's happening with, on Japan equities simultaneously as a near unanimous consensus agreement of Japan is going to be normalizing policy and exiting this like radical easing. How do you reconcile those two happening at the same time? Anyone that watches Japan and follows it understands the importance of the words they choose. So let's talk about what normalization means in Japan. If you think about moving from negative 10 basis points to positive 10 basis points, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But the message it sends is incredibly powerful. Interest rates in Japan don't need to get too high before an awful lot of capital will start coming home to the bond market and to the equity market. What would you look for when you would be getting out of Japan? It's very simple, value. 